Hello. So uh, last time we started talking about uh, periodicity. So signals are classified into periodic signals and aperiodic signals. And uh, a signal is periodic if a certain uh, condition is satisfied. Otherwise, it is not periodic. So the condition is that there exists some, some non-zero big T such that x of small t is equal to x of small t plus big T for every small t that is real. So if you can find a big T that is non-zero satisfying, satisfying this condition, then your signal is periodic. Otherwise, it is aperiodic. Now, uh, periodic signals, they come in flavors. So one of them is, you know, the, like the most straightforward periodic signal. It's the constant signal uh, with uh, basically x of t being equal to some constant uh, for all t. And uh, for this signal, any non-zero real number is a, is a period. Okay, and there is no fundamental period. And the fu because the fundamental period is uh, defined as such. Okay, so that's the definition of a fundamental period. It is basically the minimum uh, over the set of positive big T, uh, basically satisfying the condition of periodicity. Okay, so in the case of a constant signal, uh, basically we are searching for, you know, something like this, you know, so T, uh, you know, belongs to R and it satisfies, it satisfies the condition. If the signal is constant, then we are talking about R plus, right? So, um, so every non-zero every non-zero uh, real number is a period, and this set will include every non-zero uh, basically uh, positive number. And so this set here it does not have a minimum. So it does not have a minimum. Doesn't have a minimum. Okay. So there is no fundamental period for a constant signal. Uh, and again, if you if you don't know this, then uh, the the tutorial session next Tuesday will be about like. Uh, basically, minimum, maximum, supremum, infimum, and so on. Uh, then the, uh, the, peri the, the, the period itself, the period itself, yeah, you can allow it to be negative, and this is actually the, the, the way I'm using it here, so this is non-zero. But for fundamental period, if you want to define a fundamental period, you choose a positive number, okay? So uh, that's true. So for period, you can, you know, uh, basically allow negative, non-zero negative numbers, uh, but for a fundamental period, it must be a, a positive number. There are signals that are not so, you know, actually not so practical. Actually, they are not practical at all. And so they are sort of like a mathematical curiosity and uh, they, we do not like use them uh, in, in actual signal processing. Uh, and so those are periodic signals in which every non-zero real number in a uh, dense proper subset of R is a period, okay? Uh, so here, uh, for example, uh, the, um, the period uh, can be um, basically the non-zero rational numbers, okay? So it is something, you know, so basically the periods are a proper subset of R, not every R, otherwise this, the signal is a constant, uh, but the, 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 proper, the, the proper subset of R should be dense, okay? And again, this is like sort of a mathematical result, you know, that, that this, uh, this basically, the set of uh, possible periods should be a dense set. So last time I gave the example of basically the signal indicator T in, uh, in Q, uh, which is one at the rational numbers, zero at the irrational numbers. Here is another example, okay, which is like very close. So define set S to be the set of numbers uh, that uh, that has you know the set of numbers that uh, have this particular form. Uh, so each number here is basically a rational number plus a rational number multiplied by the square root of two. Okay, uh, and we can define x of t to be one whenever t is one of those guys, and to be zero whenever t is not one of those guys. Uh, then, you know, I will say it without basically proof that you can show that e actually every non-zero number in the form rational plus rational multiplied by the square root of two is a, is a valid uh, period for uh, this signal. And you can also show that this set is a dense proper subset of uh, the set of real numbers. Okay, so uh, again, those are signals that are weird. Um, you can show they are discontinuous at every t, uh, and 
this is the reason like you know you know much of practical interest no 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 so weird 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 signals are not like you know so we, you know constant signals definitely definitely constant signals are something you know you can generate a signal that is that has a a, a certain value and it it sticks to to this value uh, during you know the uh, the full operation of some system or circuit or something uh, those fun, you know those signals are also you know are also interesting so this is just you know like a mathematical thing but it is there you know it is there in uh, in uh, basically, uh, periodic signals, if you allow, you know, signals that are, you know, discontinuous at every point, which again is, um, is not something that is, but by the way, you know, even like, you know, discontinuities like jumps like this are not, you know, they do not uh, correspond to reality, right? So if you have a square wave, so square wave is a signal that belongs to this third class in which there is a fundamental period. Uh, and the square wave uh, has, you know, uh, points of discontinuity at those jumps. But here, this you know, the discontinuities are not everywhere. Basically, the discontinuities are on actually on a set of measure zero. Uh, they are at the integer multiples of some number. And um, and basically, this is an idealization because, like, if you if you have any function generator uh, generating a square wave, uh, there is no circuit that will suddenly you know, uh, giving you zero volt. And then, you know, then it gives you five volts or something like this, you know, so these instantaneous jumps, uh, abrupt jumps are not like feasible in practice. However, you can have circuits that, that do this transition from low to high or high to low in a very, very, very short period of time. So that a square, a mathematical square wave is a very, very good model uh, for basically for uh, those signals, right? So I mean I, I think there is a famous uh, statistician called Box. He uh, he has a famous um, uh, s uh, basically statement. He said that uh, all models are essentially wrong. All models are essentially wrong. So when you do a model, you know, uh, it, it, reality is very, very, it's extremely complicated. And so we model reality. And when we model reality, we tend to idealize things. Otherwise, you know, otherwise basically our models will, will not be tractable. Uh, and so to have tractability, you will have like to, you know, you know, to let, you know, let these abrupt jumps and so on. So all models are essentially wrong, but some are useful. Because if you take this to the first uh, part here and say, you know, so everything is garbage. No, you know, some models are very, very close to reality. Okay, so they are not reality, but they are very close and hence they are useful. Okay, but some are useful. Okay. Uh, so the third type is basically so when, like when, if I tell you like periodic signal, this is most likely what you you, will, you have in mind. So it's a signal uh, that has a fundamental period. Uh, in that case, uh, the possible periods of the of the signal are the non-zero integer multiples of some positive number, and this positive number is the so-called fundamental period. Okay, so those are the signals with a fundamental period. And basically, uh, all non-zero integer multiples of the fundamental period are uh, periods for that signal. And so those are, you know, the signals that you get, like in the laminar using a function generator or something, square waves and so on. And you know, the sinusoidal signals are very important. Um, uh, note that periodic signals are an idealization, right? Uh, that 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 uh, cannot exist in reality if you think about it, because uh, periodicity implies that the signal is going on forever, right? Is going on forever uh, because you know this definition here is for every t. So the mathematical definition of periodicity is very strict. So if there is a periodic signal, so there is uh, some pattern that keeps repeating forever, you know, from minus infinity to infinity, right? But when you do something in the lab, right, you start your experiment at t equals zero, right, and uh, you finish it after a while. Uh, so in, in some sense, everything, in a, every signal in practice is indeed aperiodic because like even if it's, if it's a close to a periodic signal over a large period of time, it's not, it's not periodic at, you know, uh, for, uh, for eternity, right? So you need to keep this in mind. So again, when we talk about periodic signals in practice, this means that there is a signal, you know, that is going on for a sufficiently large period of time so that it's as if like the signal is from minus infinity to infinity, right? Um, so again, you know, the difference between uh, reality on the one hand and the model on the other hand, okay? And uh, modeling is basically what, you know, what, what engineers do. Uh, models are essentially wrong. I mean, you cannot basically, uh, you know, um, uh, get something that is, you know, that is reality itself. 
And if you try to, you know, get closer and closer to reality, uh, your stuff becomes more and more complicated and you can reach a point of intractability. Okay, so you will not be able like, to do research or do proof theorems or, or do simulations and stuff like this. Okay, uh, continuous time signals, uh, sinusoidal signals, those are very important because they are basically what is used for the Fourier analysis. And, you know, that you have the sines, cosines, and the complex exponentials. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we take this parameter F0 to be, uh, F0 to be, uh, to be positive, then the fundamental period, so those uh, have a fundamental period 1 over F0. So what is the fundamental period of something like this? So cosine, cosine T, what is the fundamental period of this signal here? Uh, so, you know, you can find it in a number of ways. Yeah, uh, no, not one. You know, so basically, here is, here is the definition. So try to match this. Okay, so this is cosine. So you have here 2 pi, right? But there is no 2 pi here. So it's 1 over 2 pi, and then you have t, right? So write it in this form. So we have 2 pi, that's the 2 pi, that's here is a t, there is a t. This is just a phase shift, okay? And it will not affect anything. And then, so what is f0? So f0 is 1 over 2 pi. And so in this case, the fundamental period here is, uh, is basically 2 pi. So this is the fundamental period. Okay, and uh, and whenever you have whenever you have like a cosine or sine or complex exponential, you can basically do this. Try to write things. Uh, uh, okay, so um, uh, maybe I, I I understand now that actually that the, the answer that um, you know someone said just right now. Uh, in this course, uh, basically we have the frequency in hertz. Okay, uh, because again, like uh, you can you can have the frequency in uh, in uh, um, radians per second. Okay, so some people will define sinusoidal signals as a sine omega omega t. Okay, uh, plus five or something like this. Okay, so uh, in this course, uh, like if, if, when we do Fourier analysis and so on, uh, we will stick uh, to the units of hertz for uh, basically for frequencies. Okay, uh, so uh, you know I know that you know there are. Uh, basically, uh, text, uh, textbooks, you know, using just uh, or uh, full courses depending on basically radians per second. And this course we will stick to hertz. Okay, so this is f0 in hertz, and this will be two pi seconds. Okay. Uh, now, complex sinusoid. What uh, you know, complex sinusoid. The frequency can be positive or negative. Okay, and so uh, if the frequency of the complex sinusoid is uh, so if you have a complex sinusoid like this, e to the i 2 pi uh, minus 5, minus 5t, okay, minus 5t like this, this is valid, plus i phi, this is valid, and you can allow negative frequencies, and again, this is what is used in the complex Fourier series, and also in the Fourier transform. Now, what is the business of negative frequencies? Now, if you have sines and cosines, you can always you can always rewrite your stuff to avoid negative frequencies, right? Because, like, if you have cosine, let's say two pi minus five t, like this, you know that the cosine function is an even function. Cosine minus theta is cosine theta, and so you can simply get rid of this minus here, cosine two pi five t, right? So this is easy for a cosine. For a sine, it's sort of the same thing. If you have sine uh, two pi minus five t. Right, you know, rather than like having a negative number here, you can say, okay, sine is an odd signal, so basically sine of minus theta is minus sine theta. So you can just take the minus as an, an external amplitude and have you sine 2 pi and 5t. Okay, so for sines and cosines, you know, you don't, you know, you can avoid basically negative frequencies uh, and uh, by, you know, by basically using uh, the symmetry the symmetry of the cosine or the sine. But for a complex sinusoid, I mean, there is no way out. I mean, so you have e to the i, uh, e to the i, you know, 2 pi, uh, 2 pi, you know, minus 5, minus 5t. And then what can you do? I mean, this signal here, e to the i is not symmetric, you know, it's not symmetric. So uh, why do we have negative frequencies? Uh, you know, the, the, the abstract way of, of uh, uh, answering this is basically that, you know, it is, it is something that we have to do uh, basically from Euler's identity. So we have sines, we have cosines, and the complex uh, complex expression is basically is basically e to the uh, e to the i two pi like something like this. It is a uh, cosine two pi minus five t plus i sine uh, two pi minus five t. Okay, and uh, generally e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, and 
Now, if you want to express the cosine or sine in terms of, of the complex exponential, there is no way but to use a negative, right? So, you know, the, the, the way of basically writing cosine and sine uh, with complex exponential, you will have to say, okay, replace theta by minus theta, like this. Okay, and so minus cosine minus theta is cosine theta because uh, uh, cosine theta is an even function, and then this is an odd function, right? And then you combine them. So if you add them and divide by two, you get the cosine. If you subtract them and divide by two, I will get the sine, right? So we have cosine theta is equal to I theta plus e to the minus I theta over two, and sine theta is e to the I theta minus e to the minus I theta over two I, right? So it is like, you know, sine and cosine, if you want basically the complex exponentials, well, you know, this is the way to go. You will just, you know, you will just have to, uh, you will just have to uh, basically express them, uh, you know, using uh, two terms. Uh, one term uh, with, you know, if, if this term, if theta is positive, then this guy is negative. If this guy is negative, then the other guy is positive. So there is no way out from using like sort of, quote unquote, the negative frequency, okay? And now uh, the coming part is like, you know, those complex sinusoids actually appear in, you know, if you are doing, if you are doing uh, signal processing for uh, communication systems, uh, for receivers, not just for communication systems, you know, uh, maybe for radar systems and uh, maybe for, um, uh, for imagers and so on, uh, complex sinusoids are always there. So they are not, you know, they are not like detached from reality. Okay, so uh, let me give you an example from communications. Now, if you are if you are not in the business of communications and like you, you never heard, you know, uh, about these things, you can snooze uh, for a couple of minutes and then come back. Okay, so uh, this is not like something that is like uh, uh, very important to this course. It's, you know, uh, so again, you need like to have some familiarity with communication systems. So in a communication system, we uh, typically um, uh, transmit a complex valued signal. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I mean, what does this mean? I mean, what's complex valued, real, real part, imaginary part? So, we see this, okay? So, that's the model, right? We, we transmit, we transmit, uh, you know, a complex, you know, complex number. Uh, but actually, what we, what we mean in practice is that the real part is multiplied by a, a cosine signal generated by an oscillator. Uh, the imaginary part is multiplied by sine uh, generated by oscillator, and those oscillators operate at, at frequency, fundamental frequency at C, and then this is what you transmit. So don't worry, I mean, in practice, in, so in, like in, in, when you do communications, you'll find, you know, so we, we, you have the, your symbol uh, X, and then X is, you know, X is a symbol, you know, uh, like from a quam constellation. And so you will find that X can be like plus, plus or minus one over square root two, plus or minus I one over square root two. So the, you have like a real part and imaginary part. So what does it mean like to, to, like to, uh, to have like complex, complex symbols? It, it means, you know, basically the complex symbol is a representation. You know, in reality, what is happening is that there is a real, you know, basically the complex quantity is just, you know, um, a basically a, two real valued uh, quantities connected together, okay? And so uh, we transmit the real part multiplied by cosine, the imaginary part multiplied by a sine, and then we have a minus. Uh, some people use a plus. I mean, again, it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, it's arbitrary whether you use a plus or minus, okay? So you transmit a signal, and um, and when you transmit this signal, uh, basically uh, the signal goes through a channel, and uh, basically the channel uh, uh, causes a change in the magnitude of the received signal. Okay, so this is represented here by this magnitude of H. And also there is a phase shift. Okay, and then there is also this guy here, which is 2 pi delta FT. So this is basically, this is basically a, a term uh, that is, uh, that is uh, caused by uh, the delay between the transmitter and receiver. Uh, it's caused by uh, the so-called, you know, the so-called frequency, frequency offsets, the oscillator mismatch, uh, and by Doppler shifts, okay? Because if, if things are moving relative to one another, uh, then uh, the received frequency differs from the transmitted frequency. So there is something, you know, I'm sure that at least some of you know this very well, the Doppler shift. Uh, okay, and uh, and so forth. Okay, so let, let's see. So this is a practical receiver, and let's see how actually we get a complex sinusoid in this in this receiver. So this is called the IQ receiver. So the in phase quadrature receiver. It is a receiver with two branches, and uh, basically you get your signal. Okay, so it is again it is the transmitted stuff. 
uh, but it is a change, you know, it is changed. So there is like, again, a change in magnitude and a change in phase. And then you receive your stuff, and the first thing that you do is basically that you uh, do a low noise amplifier. Okay, so this is the low noise amplifier. Okay. And then you do something called down conversion. So down conversion, so the signal, basically the spectrum of the signal uh, is, and we'll talk about this if, if in Fourier analysis, basically uh, your signal here, it's a, it's a Fourier transform. Uh, it's basically centered around uh, this parameter, which is Fc. So we want to bring it about to the zero frequency, zero hertz. And so we do something called down conversion. Okay. And so this, uh, this is uh, what we do. We multiply by those guys. So in the receiver, there are also oscillators uh, trying to operate at the same frequency that is used at the transmitter. So those cosines and sines are generated by the, you know, basically by the transmitter. And you try basically to generate the same guys, the same guys in the receiver. So also the receiver has uh, oscillators uh, basically doing their best to operate at the same carrier, at the same carrier frequency. And so you multiply, and then after the multiplication, uh, basically uh, what you do is you do low pass filtering. Okay, low pass filtering. Okay. Uh, or you can be more sophisticated and you do something called the match it filtering, but you know, it's, you know, let's not discuss this here. And uh, after the low pass filter, you do, uh, you do an analog to digital conversion. Okay, so you take your signal and convert it into, uh, into uh, basically a, um, a sampled signal. Okay, so you take samples and typically in you know, all those, the analog to digital converter also will include a step of quantization, which, in which you take each sample and represent it using a finite number of uh, bits. Okay, so you have two branches, and uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, the other one is called the in phase, in which you multiply by cosine. The lower one is the quadrature, and it is multiplied by, you know, where your stuff is multiplied by sine. Uh, so you can conceptually think of the following: you can think of basically combining the number that you get out from here with the number that you get from there. So, after multiplying this number by an arc. So you have like two quantities, let's say alpha and beta. So you can think of alpha and beta as, you know, so one way of thinking about alpha and beta is like two dimensional vector in the, in the two dimensional uh, real space. Or sometimes it's actually more useful, more convenient uh, when you are doing your modeling and analysis to just think of these two quantities as one complex valued quantity, which you have alpha and then you have beta, you multiply beta by an i and then you have a plus sign. And there is some sort of a relationship between R2 and basically the complex and the complex plane. Okay, and yes, you can you can do your stuff without complex quantities at all. So rather than you know rather than thinking that you are basically transmitting a complex signal, you can say no, I am trans I am transmitting a two-dimensional vector, like two components. It's a valid way. It's a valid way. Uh, basically of doing things, but like, you know, but in like wireless communications and so on, typically we, uh, we rather than using R2, we simply use uh, basically um, uh, complex, you know, just one dimensional complex numbers, okay? Um, uh, so the idea is that if you, if you do this trick here, again, if you follow the, you know, what happens after the filters and so on, you will find that there is a cosine and sine that are basically, that are combined together and you get, you get a complex, you get a complex sinusoid with delta F can be positive, can be positive or negative, okay? Uh, so what is the meaning of delta F being positive or negative? In that case, actually, uh, it has a meaning that uh, if delta F is caused just by Doppler shifts, just by the Doppler shift and nothing else, uh, then it is positive if the transmitter and receiver are approaching one another. Okay, so they are getting closer. The distance between them is uh, is getting smaller, and delta F gets ne is negative if they get away from one another. Again, this is like sort of uh, how the Doppler shift. Okay, so again, uh, so if uh, nothing but Doppler. But Doubler, then you can actually have uh, basically delta F that is greater than zero, uh, you know, and delta F less than zero, depending on whether uh, the transmitter and receiver are approaching one another. So the distance between them is getting smaller or receding from one another if the distance is getting is getting large. Okay, so uh, um, so this is the direction of the shift. Yes, exactly. So the Doppler shift is that you know you, you transmit a certain uh, F C. 
and what you get is something that may be higher than FC or maybe lower than FC. So uh, uh, after doing the down conversion, you will get a complex sinusoid with a positive frequency or negative frequency. Again, uh, here actually there is like a meaning for a negative frequency or positive frequency. And don't forget that basically we have two real numbers. Two real numbers after the A to D, it's just that we can think of them think of them as just one complex quantity. It's sometimes useful, it's more convenient or something like that, okay? So uh, so basically the in-phase and quadrature components are stored, like, I mean, so, you know, so uh, this thing will be processed, so there is a digital signal processor that will take uh, this stuff and uh, start, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, decoding the transmitted information uh, or basically using that in a render system, using the Doubler shift uh, to know, uh, to know uh, or to to estimate the speeds of uh, uh, of uh, of the target, you know, if there is a target, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, the in phase and quadrature composites are just two real numbers that are stored in uh, in the uh, memory or registers of the digital signal uh, 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 processor, and then like treating, you know, we can deal with them as you know as as two parts of a complex number, a real part and imaginary part. Okay. So complex numbers are not, you know, are not, uh, are not like far-fetched. Again, the, in reality, in reality, there are several situations in which you can have like two real valued entities, and it may be beneficial somehow, uh, like to think of them as just one complex entity with a real part and imaginary part. Okay, so again, complex not, complex quantities and complex valued signals and so on are not that uh, not that far-fetched. If you have a complex valued signal. Okay, so if I tell you, typically x of t uh, is complex valued, right? So typically, uh, if you see, uh, and we'll do this like again in Fourier transform, like you know, our signals are typically from R, so t is a real number, but actually our our codomain is c. So typically, our signals are from R to c, complex valued. So what what the, what does it mean that we have a complex valued signal? Yeah, it's nothing. If two, if you can think of this as two signals, x one from R to R and x two from x two from R to R. One of them is the real part. One of them is the imaginary part. Okay. And for some reason, you know, uh, again, as a matter of convenience, making the analysis more straightforward, or and so on and so forth, it may be useful just to think of them as just one complex valued signal. In reality, they are basically uh, they are basically um, uh, two things. If I tell you that you know there is this filter with an inverse response, I mean if you don't know this, we will talk about it later in the course. Uh, so uh, what 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 is a complex valued inverse response? Again, you know basically a, a complex a filter with a complex valued in, inverse response can be thought as actually two filters. So you can think of it as actually two filters operating together. Okay, so uh, so don't be annoyed by complex, you know, the complex stuff, you know, and complex sinusoids and so on. In fact, they make life easy, and uh, and we'll see this. Like, for example, why you know we will start our four E series analysis by uh, using the trigonometric functions, sines and cosines, and then we say, you know, we have you know uh, sines and cosines. Why just not combine them with complex explanation? So they make they they make things like sort of a bit easier to handle. Okay. So uh, if you if you have slept, then it's time now to like wake up again. Uh, functions of two non-constant periodic signals. So what if you like add two add two uh, periodic signals? Let's assume that you know two periodic signals with fundamental with fundamental periods, or multiply them, or divide them, or whatever. So what will happen? So this is the question. Like if you add two periodic signals. Uh, okay, so uh, are you guaranteed to get a periodic signal? Are you, uh, you know, is there a possibility that you add two periodic signals and uh, you get an aperiodic signal and so on? Okay, so uh, so uh, typically we have signals and typically we can like, combine the signals somehow by like multiplying them, you know, uh, adding them, uh, doing any fanciful uh, thing to it, to them. And we now we want to basically investigate g of t, which is a function of these two signals, perhaps their sum. So uh, if g of t is defined as such, is it periodic uh, uh, or what? Okay, so now we have two signals. One of them, it, its fundamental period is t1. The other one, its fundamental period is t2. So let's first take the case in which t1 over t2 is a rational number. Okay, so that's the first case. So you have two periods, T1 and T2. Let's assume first that the ratio of them is, a, so basically each one of them may be an irrational number. So I'm not saying here that T1 is rational and T2 is rational. 
A, uh, both can be irrational, but the most important thing that the ratio is rational, okay? So this guy here can be uh, 2 pi, uh, this guy here can be 3 pi, okay? So each one of them is an irrational number, but the ratio, the pi will cancel, uh, and uh, basically you have 2 over 3, so it's irrational. So if T1 over T2 is a rational number, so uh, again, by definition, irrational be mean that uh, uh, you can express the number as a ratio, as a fraction, uh, with a numerator and a denominator, uh, so let's say that T1 over T2 is equal to A over B, then you multiply B times T1 is equal to A times T2 like this. Okay, so uh, if uh, if the ratio T1 uh, to T2 is a rational number, then let's say that uh, basically the rational number is the fraction A over uh, B, uh, and B multiplied by T1 is equal to A multiplied by T2. Uh, now let's divide both sides by the greatest common divisor of A and B. Okay, so uh, so by doing, you know, so again, uh, uh, this B is a natural number because these two guys are natural numbers. Okay, so, so they, these are the numerator and denominator of the rational number. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, B is divisible, B is divisible by all its factors or divisors. A is divisible by all its factors or divisors. Okay, and so we uh, basically go to the common divisors between A and B and we get the greatest common divisor. So this is, a, this is a natural number also. This is the whole number, right? Because here is B divided by one of its, uh, uh, you know, by, by one of its divisors or factors, and we are doing the same here. Okay, so if we divide both sides by, uh, by uh, basically uh, the GCD, the greatest common divisor of A and B, then uh, this, uh, this and that, so these are whole numbers, whole numbers. Okay, and let's call uh, basically uh, T1 multiplied by B over the greatest common divisor or T2 multiplied by A divided by the greatest common divisor. Let's call this thing big T, okay? So, let's now investigate G of small t plus big T. So, this big T here, you know, it is, it is, you know, it is the one that I use here, okay? So, let's do, let's basically do this check. What if I take G of, uh, of small t plus this big T, which is again, uh, it's either T1 uh, B over the GCT or T2 A over the G and these two quantities are basically the same. Uh, so what you will do is that you will go here, so this is the definition of G of T. Uh, so you will take this T and replace it by T plus big T and you take this T and replace it by T plus big T. So you will do this. And there are two formulas for big T, okay? And so uh, in X1, in the first signal, you will use this form. And in the second signal, you will use this form. Those are two equal things, right? So they are equal. Again, they are equal because, again, we assumed that uh, T1 over T2 is a rational number, so it can be expressed as a, a natural number over a natural number, A over B, and then we simply cross multiply it, and then uh, we divided both sides by the greatest common divisor, okay? And so, now let's look at this guy, okay? So this is X1 and T plus T1, B over GCD of A, A, A and B, right? So... B over GCD A and B, as I said, this is B divided uh, by uh, one of its uh, factors, one of its divisors. Uh, so B is divisible by the greatest common divisor, and so you obtain uh, a natural number. And so basically, this is multiplied by T1. So what do we have here? We have we have a multiple, a multiple of big T1, and T1 is the fundamental period of the signal X1, right? So remember that if a signal repeats, if a signal repeats every T1, uh, then it repeats at all, basically, the integer multiples of T1, okay? And so basically this is X1 of T. So this thing here is indeed X1 of T, okay? Because, because again, it's our starting point is that X1 of T is a periodic signal uh, with fundamental period T1. So it repeats every T1, and if it repeats every T1, then it repeats at every integer multiple of T1. And this is an integer multiple of T1 because we, we took this B, which is a whole number, and we divided it by one of its factors or divisors, and so we got also a whole, a whole number. And so uh, the same story applies here. Okay, so that's the reason like here we, we, we wrote a big T using T2 because, again, A divided by, its, um, uh, by the GCD uh, is a whole number, and so here we have an integer multiple of T2, and since T2 is basically the fundamental, a period of the signal x2, uh, then basically this is also x2. Then basically we get f of x1, x2, which is g of t. So what is the conclusion? What is the conclusion right now? That, 
you know, so if X1 is a T1 periodic signal, X2 is a T2 periodic signal, if the ratio of the periods is a rational number, then our function that involves X1 of T, X2 of T, let it be the sum or the product or something more fanciful, uh, basically this G of T is periodic. Okay, so G of T is periodic because, right, it is periodic because we, uh, uh, we were able to obtain a big T uh, such that G of T plus big T is equal to G of T for every, I mean, and there is nothing in our result here uh, that depends on small t. Basically, this is valid for every, uh, for every uh, small t. So, uh, so the idea is that if you have, uh, if you have uh, two periodic signals, okay, so, uh, and, and if you sum them or you multiply them and so on, if the ratio of the fundamental periods is a rational number, then, uh, for example, the sum or the product or whatever will be periodic. Okay, it will be periodic. Okay, so uh, so what we have here, this this signal here is periodic, and we know a period. Uh, so the period is you know t1 uh, multiplied by this you know b the greatest common divisor or T2 multiplied by A divided by the greatest common divisor. And uh, basically, uh, you can see why actually we divided by the greatest common divisor. I mean, we, uh, we could have avoided this division and just work it with uh, BT1, ET2 without dividing by the greatest common divisor. Uh, uh, no, see, I, that's a very good point. To, uh, we are trying basically to make big T as small as we can. So that's the trick. We are trying again to make big T as small as we can uh, by dividing by the greatest common divisor. Uh, the LCM will come uh, will come in, in discrete time segments. Here we have this division by the greatest common divisor. So we are trying to make again uh, big T to be as small as we wish. Uh, and this is this is the thing that we can do. Uh, you are dividing both sides, so you need a common divisor of A and B, and the best thing to make the two sides as small as we wish is to divide by the greatest common divisor, because this is the biggest guy that is a common factor to A and B. However, however, this is not a guarantee to be the fundamental period of G of T. Okay, so... Our, you know, so we divided by the greatest common divisor, you know, to basically, to basically make big T as small as we can, but actually our, uh, our signal G of T may have a fundamental period that is strictly less than these two guys. Okay, so keep this in mind. Okay, so this expression here is not necessarily the fundamental period of G of T. Okay, so uh, 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 and let's actually find examples in which basically in which basically this is uh, not a, a not a fundamental period. Okay, so um, uh, so I, 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 let's uh, like take extreme example. Okay, and there are others in I think in the notes that you know if you have a signal like cosine uh, two pi f zero t. Okay, so that's that's a signal. Okay. And uh, and it's a second, you know, just add a constant, okay? So if you can add a constant here, okay, C, okay? So a sinusoidal, if you add a constant to a sinusoidal signal, I mean, basically, it remains a periodic signal, and its period is 1 over F0 here, okay? And uh, so this is a signal with, P, with a fundamental period F0. So this is another signal, okay, minus cosine F0t, so that's uh, so that's a, a another signal with a fundamental period that is uh, one over f zero. Now, what happens if you add these two guys? If you plus them, you get c, and c is a constant signal, uh, and definitely, definitely, it's fundamental. It actually, has no fundamental period. Any positive, any uh, non-zero. Uh, any non-zero real number is actually a period, and it is of those types of things that do not have a fundamental period, okay? Uh, you, you will find examples in the notes again, and uh, yes, uh, it is not guaranteed uh, by dividing by the GCD that you get something that is a fundamental period, okay? 
what else? I mean, so so here it's like we took T1 over T2 to be a rational number. What if it is irrational? What if it is an irrational number? Uh, well, if T1 over T2 is irrational, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, and we don't have any other piece of information regarding the signals, uh, then uh, basically uh, the sum or the product or whatever, uh, it can be a periodic or uh, a period. Okay, so again, if you just know this piece of information and nothing else, uh, you know, it can be uh, this way or that way. However, there are situations, for example, if you are talking about the sum of two signals, sum, and uh, one of them is continuous, and the other is continuous at least at a point on R, uh, then you can show that basically if T1 and T over T2 is an irrational number, you can prove that actually G of T is guaranteed to be a period. Okay, so again, uh, you can make like statements with like these additional pieces of information. So if the ratio is irrational, and this is the only thing that you have, then you cannot tell whether basically uh, the sum of two periodic signals uh, will be uh, periodic or not. But if you have like uh, the sum and you know that one function is continuous and the other function is continuous at a point, at least at a point, then in that case you can show that an irrational ratio, if the ratio cannot be uh, basically put uh, as a fraction uh, of two uh, whole numbers, uh, then basically the signal is guaranteed to be uh, to be a period. Okay, so for example, if you are talking about sinusoidal signals, if you're talking about sinusoidal signals, then uh, then basically um, uh, sinusoidal signals are continuous. In fact, they are like as, uh, they are infinitely differentiable. In fact, so uh, so for them, uh, for them, yes. Uh, if the ratio, okay, so for sinusoidal signals, so sinusoidal plus sinusoidal, okay, so T1 over T2, uh, if it's irrational, this implies the sum is a period. You are, you know, this is true. You can show it. The sum is a period. Okay. Not only this. If you have sinusoid and sinusoid, and the, the, the full proof is in the notes, I will not, you know, it's, it's optional. I mean, you can read it or not. If you have a sinusoid and sinusoid, and this, you know, has fundamental frequency T1 and T2, the formula that we have above, which is, you know, T1 B over GCD AB, which is equal to T2 A over GCD AB, is indeed the fundamental the fundamental period of the sum. Period of the sum. Okay, so if you have pure, you know, pure sinusoidal signals, and again, one of them have T1, you know, and the, the ratio is, you know, so basically here we have T1 over T2 is a rational number. Okay, so uh, so in that case, apply you can apply the formula, and when you apply this formula, you are guaranteed to get the fundamental, get the fundamental p. Okay, uh, but generally this is, you know, as I said here, and this is statement. Generally, this is not the fundamental p. Okay, let's talk about now discrete time signals. Um, so the story is a bit different from continuous time, and let's let let's actually try to highlight the differences. Okay, so for a discrete time periodic signal, the period uh, should be should be uh, a non-zero integer. It's a non-zero integer. You cannot have a period uh, for a discrete time signal, and you know uh, the period is like 1.5 uh, or square root of two or anything like this. The period is a non-negative. It's a non-negative. Uh, uh, sorry, non-zero. The, the sorry, the the period is a non-zero integer. Okay, so in this case here, uh, period. So if periodic period is a non-zero non-zero integer okay and uh, the definition is as such we say that the discrete time signal is periodic and it has a period big n uh, if there exists a non-zero integer such that x of 
small n plus big n is equal to x of n for every small n uh, that is an integer. So if this condition is satisfied, then our discrete time signal or our sequence is periodic, otherwise it is aperiodic. And as for the continuous case, if, uh, if big N is a period, then all non-zero integer multiples of big N are also, are also periods, okay? Now, if a discrete time signal is periodic, is periodic, right? Now, uh, there is always, you know, a, con a, a concept of fundamental, of a fundamental period is there. Uh, and the reason is that the periods now are basically are, um, are uh, integers, right? So, uh, so now if you have the set, you know, of N such that uh, N is greater than zero, and you have x of n plus big n is equal to x of n for every uh, for every n that is a that is an integer. So this set now it has a minimum. Okay, so the minimum exists. For the continuous time case, the minimum may not exist. Okay, the minimum may not exist. Like if you know if you have a constant signal. Uh, if you have, you know, those fanciful signals that are basically uh, with periods, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically being um, uh, a dense, you know, a dense proper subset of uh, the set of real numbers. But here, basically, uh, you know, we are not talking about real numbers. We are talking about those guys. So n here is uh, is a positive integer. So n here is positive, or natural, oh, yeah, you can just say it's, you know, it's in n. Okay, it's in the set of natural numbers. So the minimum exists. So if you have a constant discrete time signal, it has a period, and its period is equal to is equal to one, right? So if you have, uh, suppose that you have a signal, so discrete time signals are just defined on you know an a, a, basically an integer grid, okay? So define zero, one, two, three, four, and so you, your signal can be just a constant, like this, okay? So it's a constant. But now you can talk about the fundamental period. The fundamental period is one, okay? So basically, period n is equal to one, uh, and no worries about this. But but if you have a constant continuous time signal, it does not have a fundamental period because if you if your stuff is R plus is an R plus rather than being a natural number, then R plus R plus does not have a minimum. Okay, so that's the reason a constant continuous time signal it does not have a fundamental period. Uh, but for discrete time signals, we have fundamental periods. Okay, so again, it's because uh, because the period itself. Uh, is allowed uh, uh, is only allowed to be uh, a um, a non-zero uh, integer. Okay, so this is uh, a different uh, like difference between uh, continuous time signals and discrete time signals. Uh, discrete time sinusoids are basically sines, cosines, and so on. But rather than having t, you start having the integer n like this. Okay, so you can have like something like sine a sine two pi f zero n uh, plus you know five or something like this. So again, we are talking now about the parameter is n. It's a sequence. Okay, so it is something that is defined on uh, the set of integers uh, rather than defined on the real axis. And here is the difference between discrete time sinusoids and continuous time sinusoids. Discrete time sinusoids are not necessarily periodic. Are not necessarily periodic. They may be a periodic. Okay, so let's let's basically investigate this. Continuous time uh, sinusoidal signals are guaranteed to be periodic, and their fundamental period, when you know, if f zero is you know a positive a positive number, it's one over f zero. Now for discrete time sinusoids, so let's take this guy. Let's try to check its uh, check its periodicity. Okay, so to be periodic, there must be a non-zero integer such that this is satisfied. So replace each n by n plus big n. And then cosine 2 pi f0 small n plus big n, you can write it as cosine of two guys, okay? And now, if you want periodicity, if you want to have to be periodic, right? So we want uh, x of small n plus big n to be equal to x of n itself. So how can we have cosine 2 pi f0 n plus something? We want it to be cosine 2 pi f0 n. So we want basically this thing here to be, so from the properties of a cosine, function, we want this to be an integer multiple of 2 pi, right? Because the cosine repeats every integer multiple of 2 pi. So basically, for periodicity, we need this 2 pi f0 n to be equal to 2 pi small m, where small m is 
uh, is an integer. So if, if this is satisfied, then this is equal to that. Otherwise, they are not they are not equal. Okay. So now we have a condition for periodicity that this parameter f zero here uh, multiplied by n. Again, we want this guy to be an integer multiple uh, of an integer multiple of two pi, and so f zero uh, f zero n should be equal to some m, and uh, where m is an integer. So f0, f0 should be an integer over an integer, right? Because again, the periods themselves are just integers, okay? We do not allow, like, again, 1.5 to be a period when we, we talk about discrete time signals. So f0 is now described as the ratio of two integers, two whole numbers. So f0 is rational, okay? So for periodicity, to be periodic, to be periodic, the discrete time sinusoid must, must have this parameter, this parameter F0. Now it must be a rational number. If it's not a rational number, then the discrete time sinusoid is a pair. Okay? So on the one hand, continuous time sinusoids are guaranteed, are guaranteed to be uh, periodic uh, with a period 1 over F0. Discrete time sinusoids, uh, basically, they are periodic if and only if the parameter F0 is a rational number, okay? So, uh, so let's suppose that F0 is a rational number. So, what will be the period or the fundamental period? So, let's let's say take F0 to be a, a over b, okay? So we have F0 is equal to F0 is equal to m uh, m over n, okay? So uh, again, uh, let me re-explain this. So this came from you do the test of periodicity to the uh, sinusoid. So you replace n by n plus big N, and you get something like this and say, okay, so periodic means that basically this is equal to that, and so we need F0n to be uh, to be an integer value, uh, knowing, I mean, so we are, we are taking for granted, you know, the definition and properties of the uh, cosine function. So this should be an integer, and so this should be m, and so f0 is m over m, which means that it is some rational number. Let's say that this rational number is uh, is a over b. Okay, so uh, if this rational number is a over b, if f0 is a over b, then uh, from here you can write this. You can write that n, n, okay, is equal to mb over a. Just cross multiply, okay? So n is equal to mb over a. Uh, now the part, so, so n is the period, n is a period, and hopefully we are trying to like to hunt uh, for the fundamental period of the discrete time sinusoid uh, if the parameter f0 is, uh, is a rational number. Uh, the problem is that n is expressed uh, in terms of this small m, okay, and we don't know it. I mean, so small m is what we need here so that this, uh, this uh, expression here is equal to that and we have periodicity. So how can we obtain the period or, you know, or the fundamental P? Uh, so here is the trick. We know A and B. Why do we know A and B? Because now we are basically, our starting point is that F0 is rational. So if it's rational, then we can express it as A over B, two whole numbers divided by one number. So we know A, we know B, and we don't know a small m, and hopefully we will be able to obtain a big n only as a function of a and b. So we need like, to get rid of this small m and get a formula uh, for uh, the period of the uh, discrete time sinus. So here is the trick. Now, m b is divided by a to give you big n, right? So uh, so m b must be divisible by a, right? So m b over a is a whole number. So m b is divisible by a, which means that m b is a multiple of a. Okay. So m b must be so that so that when you divide it by a, you get a whole number without fractions. So m b multiple of a. So it is a multiple of a. Multiple of a, right? Uh, moreover, m b by definition, by definition, if you take the number, if you take the number, the whole number b, the integer b, and you multiply it by some integer, then it's a multiple, right? So m b, sort of by definition, it is a multiple of b. So the numerator that we have here is a common multiple. It's a common multiple of a and b. So big M is equal to m small b over small a. So, uh, the, and this is, gives you big N. Big N is an integer. So, MB is divisible by A. MB is, is a multiple of A, 
and nb is b multiplied by an integer so nb is a multiple of b and hence nb nb is a multiple is a common multiple of a and b and so you if you know the two numbers a and b then you can uh, basically try to obtain their common multiples and guess what you know the common multiples there is a least positive common multiple so the least positive common multiple is the LCM. Okay, so so MB, so MB is the LCM of AB. And we will use the least common multiple so that we obtain the so that we obtain the fundamental, the fundamental period. Okay, so so N now is the LCM AB over A. Okay, so this is the relation. This is the relation that we have for the fundamental period uh, of the uh, of a discrete time sinusoid, so long as the parameter f zero of the discrete time sinusoid is a rational number. Because if it's uh, if it's not a rational, then actually the comp the discrete time sinusoid is a periodic. Uh, if uh, f zero is rational uh, and it is equal to basically a over b, so a over b are uh, you know natural numbers, uh, then uh, n the fundamental period is the LCM, the least common multiple of a and b divided by divided by a. And then we know, of course, that you know we know uh, that uh, the for two natural numbers LCM AB multiplied by the GCD of AB is equal to the product AB. So from this relationship here, you can I mean if you are interested, you can express your result in terms of GCD AB. If if I mean you do you don't need to, but if you want, you can do it because so this LCM here is equal from this relationship. It is equal to AB divided by uh, the GCD of AB, and then we have A in the denominator, so it can eliminate this A, and so this LCM of A comma B over A, it is exactly equal to B over the GCD of A comma AB. Okay, and uh, so we have basically this is the rule. If F0 is equal to A over B, then N is equal to this or LCM AB over A. Now, what if we sum? What if we sum uh, periodic discrete time signals? Okay. Uh, so uh, now, uh, no, note something. Uh, if if we have two periodic discrete time signals, the period of each guy, the period of each guy is an integer, and so the ratio n1 to n2 is all is always a rational number, right? So we don't have this in for co continuous time signals. So for continuous time signals. T1 over T2 may be rational or it may be irrational. Okay, uh, again, because the T's uh, can be any real number, uh, non zero real number. But here, basically, we are talking about non zero integers, and hence the ratio. Uh, the ratio uh, uh, is guaranteed to be is guaranteed to be a rational number. Okay, so this is again a difference. So uh, so uh, basically, if you add if you add two discrete time uh, discrete time periodic signals, uh, you are guaranteed. You are guaranteed to get a periodic set. So if you add two continuous time periodic signals, you know you may not get a periodic signal. But if you add two periodic discrete time signals, you are guaranteed to get a um, a, a, a periodic discrete time signal. Okay. So um, so again, uh, the sum will be periodic if we can find a big N such that you know. Uh, if you replace small n by small n uh, plus big n, you get the exact same sum. Okay. Uh, now again, you can you can always do this. You can always you can always basically do this trick here that you know you can define big n to be small m big n equals small n big n. Uh, again, because those now are not real numbers are not general real numbers. They are just you know are just whole numbers. Okay, so uh, so basically, uh, you know, you can show, uh, you know, you, you can actually give it from the meaning of an LCM. So you have two discrete time sequences. One of them, okay, so one of them, so X1 repeats every N1, which means that every multiple of N1, multiple of N1, right? X2 repeats every N2, and this means every at every multiple of N2, right? So X1 repeats 
also at the common mul you know so basically uh, you can choose the common multiples of n1 and n2 right so any two any two natural they have they have a common they have some common multiple okay uh, actually uh, they have an infinity they have an infinity of common multiples right and so and so basically that's that's the like sort of the intuition behind the lcm the lcm being uh, basically a period of the sum right because the first so you, you have your signal has like two components added together one of them repeats every n1 and so it repeats every multiple of n1 uh, the second component it repeats every n2 so it repeats at every multiple of n2 and so it must be the case uh, that basically both guys they repeat at uh, every common the sum will repeat every common multiple of uh, you know n1 and n2 and if you want to hunt for the smallest uh, big n you will go for the you will go for the lcm is this guaranteed to be the fundamental period no so it, it's not guaranteed so this is again this is the using the lcm we can use any common multiple and it will be a valid period the lcm is it indeed a common multiple and it's a valid period but is it the fundamental period of the sum two of n well again you can come up with cases in which basically this is not true uh, so we we you you know lcm means that we are we try to use basically the least common multiple so that on the hope of getting the small speed but you know you may have uh, you may have uh, basically um uh, the fundamental period being less than the common multiple so uh, again uh, here you know it's not like it's not like uh, for uh, continuous time signals for continuous time signals if you have a sum if uh, if if the ratio of the periods is irrational then the sum can be periodic or it can be aperiodic uh, if you know more about the signals if you know that one of the signals is continuous and the other is continuous at least at a point and the ratio of the periods is irrational then the sum is guaranteed to be aperiodic okay uh, if the ratio is periodic, then basically then the sum is guaranteed to be periodic. Now, for discrete time signals, now the sum is periodic. Okay, for discrete time signals, the sum is periodic again because the periods are integers, and you can just basically use this type of reasoning. You know, so there is one guy that repeats every at n1 and all its multiples, another guy that repeats at n2 and all its multiples. So each one, you know, so we repeat. You know, their sum will repeat at the common multiples, and we can choose the LCM. But so the only you know uh, point to keep in mind that the fundamental period may be something that is strictly less than the LCM of n1 and n2. Okay. I think you know. So here, uh, not sure. Okay, but I will say it. You know. Um, uh, so t take it with a grain of salt. Okay, that. Uh, LCM N1 and 2 is the fundamental uh, period if GCD N1 and 2 is 1. So if basically if these two numbers are co-prime, uh, their greatest common factor is 1, uh, basically I think the LCM is, I think the LCM is the fundamental period right so but you know so actually so I, I will think about this after the lecture and so um so this uh, let me write for myself so this is can be a potential homework problem will be a nice one potential homework problem okay and of course if the gcd is equal to one uh, then actually the lcm in this case we know that you know so i i wrote for you the rule of that basically the lcm times the gcd is the product so if the gcd is one and which means that these two numbers are a co-prime or relatively prime then the lcm actually is the product so it's guaranteed you know i think it's guaranteed if the gcd but again you know i you know i i may try like to search for it or or basically uh, come up with uh, with um uh, with a proof myself and then you know i can actually uh, not tell you the proof but make it a homework problem we'll see okay so signals can also be divided into uh, power signals and energy signals or neither so basically this classification of signals is like you know so you have three you know three classes uh, not just two like so 
in for periodicity it's like periodic versus it's periodic versus aperiodic that's it but now you know for energy and power it's basically energy signals or power signals or neither so you can use so you you have this thing that is neither okay in this type of classification and uh, so of course i mean uh, what is the definition of energy what is the definition of power and uh, what are basically the conditions that if they are satisfied then we call that the signal you know oh this is an energy signal or this is a power signal uh, or if the conditions are all uh, basically violated then we say that our signal is neither okay so um so let's quickly basically define uh, define uh, some terms instantaneous power so it will be the magnitude of x of t squared or the magnitude of x of n squared for uh, discrete time signals okay then if you integrate this thing or sum this thing uh, over an interval or uh, over uh, basically a range of index values then you get the energy in a range okay so if you take this thing and for continuous time signals and integrate it from a to b uh, then you are computing the energy uh, on the interval from a to b and if you sum this quantity from n1 to n2 then you are computing the energy over this range uh, of uh, in you know the index range uh, from small n1 to small n2 uh, typically, you know, when we do the classification, we are interested actually in the total energy, and I will just refer to it as energy. Okay, so most likely I will not use the term total again. So if I, I if I just say energy, then I mean it's basically uh, the integral of magnitude x of t squared over the whole real axis, and for discrete time signals, then this index will be the integer. So typically, so again, uh, uh, we will be interested in the total without you know, so without necessarily saying that it is total. Uh, if I want the energy uh, on a specific interval, I will say this explicitly. You know, compute the energy of this signal over the interval from 0 to 1, for example, okay? Uh, but if I just say energy, then automatically it means the total energy, which is, again, as an integral, it's from minus infinity to infinity, and as a summation, it's summation over the integers, okay? The power, you know, again, you know, it, it should be called like the average power. But, you know, if I just say power, then I mean the average power. And the average power is defined by these limits, you know, if, if the limits exist. So if you see here for continuous time signals, what you do is that you take the magnitude square. And note that the magnitude square that is involved here and here and here and here. So all those guys are what? So x of t or x of n may be complex valued, but the magnitude square is real valued and non-negative. Okay, so once we talk about the integral or summation involved in the calculation of power or energy, then we are talking about something. So even if your function x of t is complex valued, but you don't do the function itself, uh, you uh, or, or not it's a square, because the square of a complex number is a complex number, but we take basically, we take the magnitude squared so we take the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So we end up with something that is guaranteed to be real valued and non-negative. So for the power, if the, our signal is continuous time, we integrate from minus L to L, sort of minus L to L. Then we divide by 2L. Basically, 2L is uh, basically the, the length of the interval. So it's as if we integrate from minus L over the interval from minus big L to big L. And this is an interval of length 2L, so we scale, we divide by 2L, and then we take the limit as L goes to infinity. So this is how we define the average power. Uh, for, for discrete time signals, we do something that is similar. You know, we sum not from minus infinity to infinity, but we sum from minus M to M, and then we take the instantaneous power, which is just the magnitude square, and then how many terms we have in this summation. So we have in this summation, uh, basically, the index goes 1, 2 to m, right? And then the index minus 1, minus 2, minus m, and 0, okay? So the index uh, basically has 2m plus 1 terms. So 2m plus 1 terms in this summation here. So from 1 to m, from minus 1 to minus m, so that's, you know, so those together are 2m uh, terms, and then we have the term n equals 0. Uh, yes, I mean, so basically, I mean, so this is a window, but actually we do not stop at this window, you know. You may compute something like, you know, the, the, the energy over a particular window, 
right? But here, it's not just that we do this type of rendering and look at the signal from minus big M to big M. We then divide by the number of terms, which is 2M plus 1, and then we take the limit. So here we are not just interested in some finite value of M. In fact, we are interested in the limit as big M, as big M goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, so this will be the this will be the power. Now the energy the energy of a signal, you know how it, how it is like related to like actual energy, uh, for example in a circuit or you know, it's related. But again, it, it depends. So what is your x of t? So is your x of t like a current? So it's uh, it's the variation of the current uh, in some branch of the circuit over time, or is it a voltage? And if it's a current or a voltage, then uh, basically what is the load resistor or load resistance, right? So actual power or energy in a circuit uh, will be something like, you know, that requires more knowledge. So is X, uh, again, energy, uh, is X voltage or current? You know, what is the resistance that you are talking about and so on and so forth, okay? So, so here we are talking about energy and power in sort of an abstract way. Uh, uh, that depends only on x of t, but in practice, if you if you are doing circuits and you are talking about an actual energy uh, basically delivered to some load, uh, then you need actually to specify whether again your x of t is in, is current or voltage, and uh, basically you need to talk about things. You know what is the resistance and stuff like this. Okay, so here we are abstract. Okay, so don't take this energy and power to like to mean a real thing. You know? you know, actual energy or actual power. You need, like, basically some other uh, things to know so that you can convert these to actual powers consumed in some circuit, for example. Okay. So, energy signal. So, if you go and compute E, if you compute E, and you find that E is, is positive and finite, so it is living between zero and infinity, hey, so we have an energy signal. Now, if you compute P and you find that it is from zero to infinity, then you say, oh, my signal is a power signal. Then if basically what you get is something that is not this or not that, then it's neither. So, for example, you can compute the energy to find that it's zero. And in that case, the power will be zero. And, you know, this will be a signal. This will be a signal which, like, basically zero energy, zero power, it's neither. An example of the signal will be our annoying signal you know, the indicator of T, you know, the signal that is one on the rationals and zero on the irrationals, right? So this would be an example of a signal that basically that, you know, energy is zero, power is zero. And you can come up uh, actually with, uh, with examples for the other cases. So to, again, for energy, this must be satisfied. And typically, this is the first thing that you do in a problem. Like if, you are, if I classify this signal, is it an energy signal or power signal or either? First step is that you check, is it an energy signal? So you go and compute the energy using the integral if it's continuous time or the summation if it's discrete time. And then what you do is that you, you, you know, fine. If you get a positive finite result, oh, that's an energy signal. If not, then you try to compute the power. Now, again, if you get the power as a finite positive number, then it is a power signal. If you fail again, then that's it. Then your signal is neither, uh, neither power nor energy signal. Now, if your signal is an energy signal automatically, so here I didn't write it because it's like you can prove it. That, you know, so for example, here you compute the energy, then you say, okay, so for signals that are energy signals, if we try to compute the power, will we get something that is arbitrary? No, you will get B equals zero, guaranteed. So for energy signals, if you go and compute the integral or the infinite sum of the energy, and you get a finite positive number, and so your signal is an energy signal, you do not need to do anything else. The, you know, the power is guaranteed to be equal to, to be equal to zero. Why is this true? Well, okay. You are basically, exactly, so basically it is like, exactly, it is, if you want to say things rigorously, it is the squeeze or sandwich theorem. Okay, uh, it is how the power is defined. So we have this in the numerator of the uh, definition of the power, right? So you are basically here integrating something that is non-negative from minus L to L. Definitely you have an, up, this, this thing is greater than or equal to zero. So this thing here is non-negative. And so it is basically lower bounded, lower bounded by zero. And what is the other bound? 
The other bound is that you basically take the summation from minus infinity to infinity. Of course, this guy can be plus infinity, but plus infinity is an upper bound. It's not a problem. So basically, this, uh, this integral here from minus L to L is again lower bounded by zero, and it's upper bounded by the integral from minus infinity to infinity uh, magnitude x of t squared dt. Now divide all sides by 2L, and then take the limit as L goes to infinity. So the left-hand side, you know, it's basically 0 over 2L. For any finite L, this is 0, and so the sequence of zeros will converge to 0. And on the right-hand side, you have E over 2L. Now for an energy signal, E is a finite positive number, and so basically if you divide by 2L and take the limit as big L goes to infinity, you will get also a zero. So basically, by the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem, basically you have a quantity, you know, that is upper bounded, lower bounded by something, you know, those things, the limits are zero. So the, uh, the middle guy will go to zero. So the power, of, the power of an energy signal is guaranteed to be equal to zero, and you don't really need to compute it uh, if you get an energy, if you get an energy signal. Now, for the power signal, the energy is the energy is infinity. Okay, for the for the power signal, the energy is infinity, right? Why you can you can basically it's the contrapositive, the contrapositive, right? Because if 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 basically if the energy is finite, you know if the energy is finite, what we obtain here is the power is equal to zero, right? If the energy is finite, the power will automatically be zero. So for a power signal, you want the power to be something to be something that is greater than zero, right? So to be greater than zero, your only hope is to have the energy equal to plus infinity. Okay, so you need your integral to explode, or if you are doing discrete time signal, you want basically your summation to give you plus to give you plus infinity. Okay, so so a power signal has infinite energy, an energy signal has zero, and power signal has infinite energy. Yeah, it, it, you know, it basically, you know, this classific, you know, you know, it's um, uh, sometimes like when you um, deal with uh, with signals, um, uh, you know, uh, so for example, I mean, uh, say energy signals, if you think about energy signals, those are L2 signals, right? So they are uh, energy signal, let me write it here, actually. So those are, remember that the L2 norm, so the L2 norm of the signal is just the square root of E. So for an energy signal, basically the L2 norm, the L2 norm is finite, and so we know it's an L2, an L2 signal, okay? Uh, or uh, basically, if it's a sequence, it's an L2 sequence. So uh, why this is important? Again, if you are doing anything with a summation, you know that you know that uh, basically um, uh, uh, that you know if you sum the uh, the instantaneous powers of all samples of the signal if the signal is discrete time then you are guaranteed to get something that is that is finite now power signals are sort of an idealization okay that is useful uh, for example most periodic signals uh, are power signals it's it's typical that there are power signals because typically a periodic signal has a finite positive power on a period and a mathematical peri a mathematical mathematical um, mathematical um, basically uh, a periodic signal repeats every you know from for eternity and so basically it's a total energy will always be infinity because like if over a period the energy is something that is is finite you want you know that this is repeated you know uh, you know, for uh, basically eternity, and so from minus infinity to infinity, and so the energy will be infinity. So basically, energy signals are what we have in practice. So in, if you are, if you are talking about practical uh, signal, typically what we encounter in practice is energy signals. Okay. However, power signals are a good idealization. They are sort of the next best thing. So those guys, they have infinite energy. And infinite energy is not there in practice. Uh, but again, like I told you that even periodics, the concept of periodicity is fiction. It's not true because nothing keeps repeating forever from minus infinity to infinity, right? But we will pretend that something goes on for infinity. So in that case, maybe this integral is useless, but at least there is some sort of, you know, uh, of a finite power energy over a period, for example, and this will be reflected in a finite power 
and we actually see a formula uh, for the average power for periodic for periodic signals. Uh, so in practice, we can use power signals as models. So signals like sinusoidal signals, which are like we can use them. They are power signals, a square wave, a triangular wave. Again, in practice, they are in fact energy signals, not power signals, because they start at some t equals zero and they stop whenever you, you basically turn off your experiment, you, you end your experiment or you turn off your uh, basically uh, equipment or whatever. Uh, but it's a good, it's a good idealization. And uh, it means that things are mathematically tractable, right? Because uh, basically the integral explodes, but if we scale the integral by something, then you get a finite limit. So it, you can play with those signals and do derivations and so on and so forth. Okay. If the power is infinity, then uh, uh, then we don't have uh, you know uh, energy or power signals, but actually those signals are also useful. Okay, so again, it's, it's again, it's, uh, let me give you an example. So what is something that is not an energy or power signal? Exponential, okay, so e to the t, right? So e to the t is something that really explodes. It's a scary, right? Uh, if you compute its energy, it's infinity. If you compute its power, you can show actually that the power is also infinity. And nothing in reality, nothing in reality can keep on going exponentially forever. Right. So despite the fact that this is neither, still we can pretend we can take part of the signal over a finite interval and, you know, say that there is an exponential growth, for example, in the number of people with a certain disease or sickness or something like this. OK, so uh, so again, uh, uh, what we are talking about are basically models and characterization of the mathematical models using things that make the math, you know, tractable and sort of useful, but never forget, you know, basically that reality is different. We don't really have periodic signals and we don't really have power signals, again, because typically we have just, you know, some finite, some finite energy, you know, maybe if you take the whole observable universe, you know, it has some finite, it may be an extremely large value, but it's some finite, some finite energy, if we talk about actual energy, right? Uh, but you can, you know, you can, I mean, if you just stick to reality, as I said, you know, you will go, do, like, as a researcher, you will go nowhere, okay? Reality is messy, is very complicated, and you need to use models. And when you use models, you need, like, basically your model to be well, what is called well-behaving. It sounds nice. So, for example, it would be nice if the energy or LP norm is some finite number. It, it makes, you know, so you are guaranteed that, you know, if you do this or that, you get convergence, you do this. Right. And, uh, you know, so if, if this integral is, is infinity, then maybe the next best thing is to have this scaled integral to be finite. Uh, but again, you know, this does not mean that basically, you know, signals, crazy signals like the exponential one, it's a crazy mathematically because it keeps growing and growing uh, faster than any polynomial. Uh, but again, like you can you, you can talk about exponential growth if you just focus on some period of time. Like if you have, if you have like a breakdown in a circuit, so in a circuit you may have like the, the voltage can grow very rapidly, right? Uh, however, it will not grow exponentially forever. Then, you know, after a while the circuit will explode and this will be the end of the exponential growth. So, uh, so basically, uh, so exponential here will be, you know, will be, so it is a signal that is neither power or energy, but it is still useful if we, again, if we uh, confine it to some, over some finite interval of time. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's like, it's an interplay and, you know, sometimes like, you know, uh, basically, uh, you, you will have to go back and forth between like the abstract domain and the practical. Some, sometimes actually you can just live in the abstract. This is what mathematicians do. You can just live in the abstract domain. Okay, but if you are sort of an engineer with like practical, practical tendencies, then, uh, then uh, also these things I'm talking about, they are not, you know, they are not, uh, it is, you know, it is uh, useful to talk about periodic signals and power signals and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, for periodic signals, most of them are power signals, okay? Most of them are power signals. And in fact, 
uh, for periodic signals, uh, you know, you can compute the power rather than rather than using the formula with the limit. You can compute the average power, or just I will just say the power using the integral over a period, and then you divide by the period in the continuous time case, and in the discrete time case, you can sum, you can sum over a period rather than summing uh, from minus m to m and then dividing by 2m plus 1 and then taking the limit you can sh you can just sum over a period and then you can divide by n without taking limit or anything and you will get a correct formula a correct formula for the uh, for the power okay so uh, so actually you know because i think we are running of time so let's do the proof next lecture let me just comment on this summation over a period and integral over a period. Uh, so uh, by summation over a period, if, if the signal repeats every n samples, what can be the summation over a period? So you can sum it, for example, from zero, right, to what? Not to big N, right, to big N minus one. X of N is good. So you can do something like this. Okay, so this is a summation over N samples that keep repeating because the signal is n periodic it basically x of small n plus big n is equal to x of n so you can do this sum or you can start at any arbitrary index basically alpha and you go to alpha plus n minus one okay so this is what i mean by a summation over a period you need to cover a period okay and you know it may be just you know um you know convenient to go from uh, x of 0 to x of big N minus 1, or you can, again, sometimes you go from some arbitrary index to the arbitrary index plus N minus 1, okay? Uh, for uh, for continuous time signals, integral, integral, so uh, the common uh, ways here, if you have uh, the signal is T periodic, and so x of T plus big T is equal to x of T for every big T, and then uh, it is basically uh, convenient to integrate sometimes from zero to big T. So you can have it like this. Sometimes the signal is symmetric and to exploit symmetry, uh, you go from minus big T over two to big T over two. Okay, so sometimes this is uh, preferred or more convenient or you can do it generally. So sometimes you can start from any arbitrary beta and then go to beta plus big T. So the important thing again is that the, uh, the upper limit of integration is big T uh, plus the lower limit of integration. Okay, so the, and uh, you know, we will take it for granted that basically if you have a periodic signal, if you integrate it over a period, you will get the same result no matter you know where you start. So you can start your integration from some beta. You stop at beta plus big T. If the signal repeats itself every big T, you know, then beta doesn't really matter. You can set beta equal to zero and integrate from zero to big T if it's convenient. Or you may set beta equal to minus big T over two and basically uh, uh, do a symmetric, you know, symmetric integration about zero from minus big T over two to big T over two. Uh, same story for discrete time signals. You sum over a period. It means that you need to sum. You need to sum over uh, over uh, n of the samples. Uh, you, typically, you take them from zero to big n minus one. And this is the convention used in something like the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, but you can generally go from some index alpha and you go to alpha plus big N minus one. 